Jones. Are you are you as cool as the Lori in, in Little Women? Lori no, I'm afraid to be honest because I'm here to be honest today. <laughs> um, I am not cool at all. <laughs> Well, I think that's exactly what Lori would have said in Little Women. <laughs> she probably would go there. <laughs> he was a liar. <laughs> no, he was not a liar. That book is an American treasure. <laughs> and that's I'm not, not kidding. If you think I'm kidding now, I'm not. That if you haven't read Little Women recently, yeah. Yeah, it's it's um, it's something that will never age. Louisa May. Did you think? Did you see that movie that came out a couple of years I, ago? I give it an A. The actress who played Joe. Yeah. Who is the 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 real the pearl of the book is Joe. I mean, mm -hmm. all the characters are amazing, but Joe is um an American hero. I like I liked it too. It and the actress great. who played Joe was good. I mean, it was much, much better than some a lot of the previous versions. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry if you guys are not into Little Women. We're gonna we're going on a, we're, we're a first of of a number of tangents here, but um, <laughs> it just had to be spoken of because they actually filmed it about fifteen minutes from Lori Lasseter's house. And um, the filmmaker Greta Gerwig does transcendental meditation. And she filmed it at a retreat center that I'd been to because I've been doing Transcendental Meditation for 40 years. And Greta Gerwig, if you haven't seen, um, what's the other one she did set in Sacramento about the coming of age? Um, <laughs> come on, folks, talk to me here. Same actress played the lead character. In, Lady Bird. Uh, Lady Bird. Greta Gerwig, you know, kind of, she went to another level of fame after Lady Bird because it got a lot of Oscar attention. And that's what allowed her probably to have the budget to make Little Women. Mm -hmm. Lori, do you, uh, so you like Little Women? A lot with Lori Lasseter. Yes. And I have to say, mm -hmm. I identified with Joe. I also yeah. identified with Lori. And I identified uh -huh. with Joe so much that I, I remember I played Joe in a play at one point. Oh my goodness. Really? <laughs> huh. Uh, so you I'm were Joe. Joe. So you were Joe for a while. <laughs> were, were you interested in, in acting at the time? No, I was more interested in being a tomboy and a writer. Oh, those, those wow. Were my interests since very, very young, from a very young age. Yeah. So we have a lot of old friends on the call, and I'm sure you have more than I do, because you probably have more friends than I do anyways, but we're going to do a little open up intro here. Eric Thompson is my name. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Center for Family Studies. I've been involved with Bowen Theory for 25 years, and my guest today is Dr. Lori Lasseter, who is a senior scholar in Bowen. And... Um, somebody who I would rate as one of the founders of the Vermont Center for Family Studies. She's a big supporter of my mentor, Dr. Ann Bunting, who's an extraordinary person and um, a collaborator with Ann, and I think uh, put wind in Ann's sail. And she used to come up way early on um, when I was kind of just a kid and I heard her present. And <clears throat> I would say, Lori and I have had a fairly significant collaboration from my perspective over the years. And I would say it's kind of evolved into a colleagueship over time. Um, and I think you probably all know Dr. Lasseter, but there's some here who might not. So I'll just say a little bit more that she's published quite a bit in the Family Systems Journal. She's given national presentations. She's taught nationally. And you know, one of the unique features is she started to talk in a disciplined way about how well she knew Dr. Bowen, who inspired so many people. So she, she seems to have had a knack for having very well-known people become interested in her <laughs> and for her to be a really good student of these two mainly people, one of them, Dr. Marie Bowen, 
And in a minute, I might ask Lori a really open-ended question, like, what was he like? Um, but the other person is um, Dr. Lynn Margulis, who's one of the most famous microbiologists of the 20th century, who Lori had a very interesting um, mentoring relationship that I think also became a a collaborative peer relationship over time. So that is my introduction to Dr. Lori Lasser. Thank you so much, Eric. And um, I do feel I must make some corrections. First of all, <laughs> I never had a social relationship with Dr. Bowen, so I can't really. Uh, I didn't say that. I, I know you didn't. All right. But people may have made an assumption. True. What you said. Secondly, I never had a peer relationship with Lynn Margulis. <laughs> okay. And the third thing I want to say is uh, you suggested I have more friends than you. And <laughs> I just want to... <laughs> You don't know how many friends I have, Lori. I have a sense of you as a person, though. And, uh, <laughs> you know, besides being like a likable guy, the other thing about you is you really you really make the effort. It's mm -hmm. not just, um, you know, waiting for people to come to you. You really huh. extend yourself. And in, because, in part because of that, you're just very good at relating to people. So, so thank you for that. Well, I, My, sure, I sure ain't nothing special, Lori Lassiter. You <laughs> should talk to other people about me before you get your opinions. Okay. One thing about me is I'm extremely um, bad at parties. Are and I, don't, I, tend, I tend to not accept invitations. <laughs> Because I just, why go fail again, you know? Yeah. So anyways, thank you. What do you think about the question about, would you like to take a crack at that? What was Murray Bowen like? Well, you know, I've been working on this uh, collection of tapes that individuals uh, taped when they were in session with him. And mm -hmm. one of the things that stands out to me is how emotionally present he was. Um, even to a surprising degree, <laughs> you knew wow. how he was feeling moment to moment. And if he felt angry, he would, he would just express it. Really? Um, yeah. Very emotionally present, not distant. Now there was objectivity there. I mean, there was his remarkable ability to think in a systems perspective. The other thing I remember about him is he, he was coaching people for the whole family. He wasn't only interested in that individual client who was meeting with him. He was thinking about all the other individuals and thinking about the family as a whole. What an innovator, you know, and I, I can relate to that when I, I mostly am working with businesses now, but I feel the family in the room when I'm talking in a family business. I have them on my mind and it's such a simple thing, Lori, but you know, when I grew up in psychotherapy, I was really trained to take the side of my client and to view the family as the enemy, to be honest, the sort of source of the problem. And it was such a relief to be let out of that cage. Mm -hmm. So you said something interesting that um, that it was surprising to you how emotionally, what, which present he was? Yes. Can, why surprising? Why did it surprise you? Um, I'm not sure, but I'm not sure why. But um, one thing I'll say is that I had attended clinical conferences that Dr. Bowen did. And I had attended other things where videotapes of Dr. Bowen working with people uh, was presented. And yeah. in the one-to-one -one interaction, 
it was a very different kind of experience. You know, it yeah. in the clinical conferences, it was um, it was uh, you know very calm, very thoughtful. Um, <laughs> question, That's an annoying word, thoughtful. Question, <laughs> questioning. <laughs> I mean, there was nothing wrong with it. I just. Oh, uh, yes, there I, is. I went to all the uh, clinical conferences that he did that I could. And, um, but anyway, it was mostly about questioning and how interesting it was how people opened mm -hmm. up more and more um, as he. You mean did a lot in of the conference or in the one to one with you? No, in the conference. Okay. Brilliant but, man. Yeah. But can I ask you something, Lori? So I remember, you know, when you say this, I just remember so distinctly hearing him say in that uh, first, I think it was the first filmed version of his basic series, you know, real black and white. It almost looked early 60s, kind of. I think it was Medical College of Virginia. And he said in like the second show, he says, I'm much more, I'm much more uptight on camera than I am in person. So that comes to mind. Do you think that's a factor in this or no? I never thought he was uptight on camera. That never would have occurred to me. Okay. Uh, I think he was, but you you um you were surprised at the difference. So what's an alternative explanation for that difference than the one I just offered? Um, that's a good question. It, I have to say that I, I experienced it as two worlds that were not integrated for me. And one of the things I'd like to do with this project in working with these tapes is to somehow integrate the two worlds for myself. I'll say the two worlds of the clinical conferences and then meeting with Dr. Bowen one-to-one, -one, but the two worlds were really those meetings and how it revealed Bowen theory in my own family and to see it so vividly. Um, so I would say that's one world and then the whole rest of the world is the other world. <laughs> Can, can I ask, uh, let's, like, let's bring the audience, make sure the audience is in with our conversation. So you mentioned a project with the tapes. Can you just summarize that briefly and then I'll. Yeah, so, yeah. so um, a number of people asked Dr. Bowen if they could tape his sessions and his frequent response was, you don't need to tape these. You know, you'll remember what's important. But some individuals did, with his permission, tape their sessions. And I have a collection of those. And what I mean by two worlds is, for me, Bowen theory is, opened up a whole new world for me, which is not entirely, to be honest with all of you, <laughs> since I came here, to be honest, it's not entirely integrated with with my the rest of my life and the rest of my understanding of the world. It was that surprising and radical. And his being so emotionally present was only part of the surprise. <laughs> so if, if you were speaking now to a, a person who, you know, has never been to a national Boeing conference or maybe hasn't read Bowen's book, et cetera, and they ask you, what do you mean? Um, what are you talking about with this whole new world that it that you still haven't integrated? What are you talking about? What what is it? I hope I'm generating interest in these uh, mm -hmm. tapes. This because I eventually I'd like to publish this book. <laughs> so I hope I've piqued your curiosity. Wh which book? Excuse me. It's a book I'd like to edit of the individual sessions with Dr. Bowen. I see. Um, 
it's not near, it doesn't have a title. It's not nearly at that point. Um, but I would say Dr. Bowen was different from what I experienced at, for instance, I was recently at the symposium and it's very different for the most part. It's very different from the way Dr. Bowen was. For one thing, he was so present. Even, you know, when I say he was emotionally present, he was just present intellectually, emotionally. He was, he was extraordinarily present. Hmm. And when he was at the symposium, he was extraordinarily present then. You never knew what <laughs> surprising, provocative thing he was going to say or question. Yeah ask i just laugh because that it's a little bit of delight with that when we're around someone who is unpredictable it makes me think of acting and laurie and i think we both have an interest in acting i studied acting and it's like one of the main things you learn early on if you have a good teacher and it's it's really hard to learn it it could take five years is that you, you take the script and you're on stage in front of these people and you have to surprise them and you have to be improvisational with the script. You have to, you have to not know what's happening next, otherwise it's boring. So that comes to mind in terms of presence. What do you think of that? I don't have a comment on that. I never learned, I did study acting a little bit, but I never learned to do it. Yeah. Well, I think he was improvisational. That's what I would take from what you said. I never, um, never met Bowen. I never was with Bowen. Mm -hmm. so I'm a generation of a leader within the Bowen network who never met Bowen. Yeah. So it's good. It's good to hear these stories. Very interesting what you just said, that it's really different. It takes a lot of strength to be like that. It takes a lot of courage. Hmm. And I'll just add that not only was he very present in the moment, but he did think strategically and he did a lot of planning about how he would present himself and the information he had. <laughs> it wasn't just improvisation. It was a planned improvisation. Mm. Would you care to, would it be interesting to you to, you know, you can guide me too, Lori, I don't need to drive here, but I will have questions until midnight if we keep going. Um, I'd like to hear more about that um, and why it matters. Um, yeah, I've thought about it. I've thought about, does it matter whether these tapes are ever you know, in an edited form and in a book form and get communicated. I mean, I'm going to, there's different levels of my commitment to these tapes. But one of the questions is, does it really, is it important? Is there anything that it, does it, does it tell you something new about the theory? Mm. I, I can't say that it really does. Mm contribute anything that changes the theory. Mm -hmm. The difference is that it just came alive in myself and my own family. I think that was the difference. And it was just, and of course, his, <laughs> uh, I know that's such an overused word, you know, and people have already said he's a genius, but it really, <laughs> It really does fit that that one area that he became so astute in in seeing the way the emotional system works. I mean, it was it was it was really remarkable. But I've thought and thought, and I've looked back at uh, you know summaries of the theory and his writing about what the theory is and. Um, mm -hmm. 
doesn't change the theory. Yeah. But, you know, for instance, at the symposium, I presented a recent effort I made in putting two together and self out. Now, this is for those who don't know the um, Bowen Center that Bowen founded has a symposium every fall and Dr. Lasseter presented there. Go ahead, Lori. So that's where I learned to do how to do that. Now, whether how one, to do how to do what? How to put two together and self out. In other words, it's a way you learned of, to do it watching him. Yes. Okay. It's a way of of working with the triangle. And you know, we we generally think about not getting pulled in to participating in the triangle, but that's a more passive or can be more passive way. Um, in other words, if, you know, I, I've been, become very close to my brother and my sister. So if one of them makes some kind of comment about the other, um, which, is, <laughs> which is probably unlikely, but if they were to do so, then I might say, oh, you know, I don't think about it that way, or I might just not say a word at all, which sends a message to. Yeah, um, very but, powerful one. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll just put in here that, because not I've told pretty much everyone, but I would like to state it here for people who don't know, uh, which is that, I was the child most focused on in my family. And that's, that's one of my interests in, um, I'm working on a memoir just, you know, after I turned 70. <laughs> um, and um, that's one of the things I'm interested in is communicating from what it's like to learn Bowen theory when you are the most impaired, most focused on child in your family. So many people I know in the Bowen theory were not in that position. Right. I'll just add that one of the advantages that I have now that I'm in my early 70s is that I have very high functioning siblings. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a, Lori, I'm a bit of a translator, so I'm just going to try to translate back something you said into a little bit of a different language, which is that when when Dark Lasser says most focused on, this relates to one of the eight concepts in the Bowen theory, which is the family projection process, which is an attempt to define very clearly how anxiety travels from the family system and becomes collected in one individual. And um, this term focused on isn't isn't a positive or a negative thing. It means that the focus of the anxiety is that person and that's how it flows. So people have used the term IP or identified patient, which is similar, but it's really not quite as precise. And it's also a little bit more hero victim than this, this way of talking about it. So, um, then you said the most impaired, which I think follows along with that theoretical prediction that the most focused on one is becomes the most impaired. Yeah, I'll just put in another word about this. Um, my sister is the only child of my parents who was unplanned. Hmm. And she and I have talked about this, that I was very, I was planned and I was very important to both parents. And mm. my sister had more of an opportunity to go her own way because she wasn't needed so much to stabilize the marriage or meet some kind of emotional need in the parents. I just thought that's interesting that, that even though she was unplanned or I mean, because she, <laughs> because she was unplanned. <laughs> She grew up a little freer than I grew up. We have a brother who's who's even freer than my sister, but um, anyway. 
you often um i th i said to you recently that you're you've become disciplined at seeing universals and uh, one of the reasons i think your memoir will be interesting to read and uh you said something <laughs> that i thought was I, I stayed stayed with me. Uh, actually, I heard you quoted as saying that um, when people have their first kid, they become less dependent on their parents. And um, just comes to mind as along the same territory here, how dependency, as you mentioned, you know, more dependency on the most focused on kid, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, a, a situation I'm involved in now where the family's been all tangled up about a successor uh, in the next generation. And ooh, <laughs> my goodness, the uh, level of suffering they all have over what she's doing and not doing. And, and then she got pregnant and man, did it settle down. Mm -hmm. And um, as, as she gets bigger, belly i'm watching her differentiate mm -hmm. so it's not really a planned differentiation maybe to some degree you know the meager impact of eric thompson's work but um in comparison to that getting pregnant is small potatoes <laughs> and i do think in this case you know it wouldn't be in every case but the pregnancy is stimulating natural differentiation and everybody's yes. happier <laughs> and i can speak to that with um something I, I did write in my script for today we have a son who's 31 he's our only child and we attempted to stay together as a nuclear family longer mm -hmm. than most and each one of us participated in holding on to that. <clears throat> my son, by the choices that he was making, my husband and myself, each one of us. And one of the things that my husband and I did is we, we remortgaged our, we refinanced our mortgage in order to purchase several acres of land for him that is about a mile down the road. <laughs> <laughs> from our cabin that was one of the ways we were holding on um anyway luck luckily or unluckily he was our son was unable to get the usda loan that would make it possible for him to build a home there oh. so we kind of put it off but in the meantime and this speaks to uh the woman's pregnancy i think our son um, the young woman that he's kind of been in love with for, you know, pretty much his whole life initiated hmm. a relationship with him. Whoa. Yeah. Not like Lori. <laughs> Lori got dumped. The long suffering <laughs> Lori got dumped. Not this. Okay. So this was, this was, uh, to speak to that the pregnancy being a kind of that was Lori from Liddy Women, by the way. Sorry, I had to clarify that because she has the same okay. name. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean Lori Lassiter. Sorry, I meant Lori from Little Women. Well, I didn't think so, but <laughs> <laughs> took his connection to this female. Mm. I think that allowed him to be more defined with his parents. Wow. I'll just add that all three of us recognized that we, you know, we weren't moving forward in terms of the life stages. And each one of us, it's true, each one of us were holding on to that nuclear family of the three of us. But mm -hmm. each one of us was also looking for ways to let go. But it actually mm -hmm. took this female from outside the family mm. to uh, motivate a significant change in our son and in our family. Mm -hmm. Just put in one more comment about this uh, because it's in my script. I want to include it. 
This makes yeah. me think of Laura Havstad's research on weight loss. Mm -hmm. And what she observed is that when some other part of the emotional system of the family reaches resolution, like the resolution of an unresolved emotional issue, that individuals were able to lose weight because um, yeah. they were they were part of that emotional system of the family. And I, I'm looking to use my son's move to Denver as an opportunity for me to begin some, begin and also follow through with projects. Mm -hmm. And I have a sense that there is a kind of resolution that's occurred, but he, he made the changes he made through connecting with someone outside of the family, which I think is analogous yeah. to the woman's pregnancy. It does free you up a bit from your dependency on the others. I was lucky to um, be able to be around Dr. Ann Bunting a lot. And um, tomorrow, actually, in our training program, I'm going to facilitate a conversation and, and do a lecture on the case study of her neighborhood leadership project, which if anyone has not read this, it's a treasure within the Bowen theory literature that is was published in the Family Systems Journal. I can give you the references if you email me. It's a short case study. It's extraordinary. I don't think there's anything like it in the Bowen uh, literature. It, it's over in the direction of the anonymous paper, but it's quite different than that. And it's about a neighborhood. And those are some of its unique features. But um, anyways, Lori, um, she, I remember one, <laughs> when her, like her last son, Adam had uh, gone to college and we were in some meeting and she says, I had this sudden tremendous urge to get a dog. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, what was I thinking? I don't need a dog. <laughs> and she indicated like you that she was really more interested in work mm. and doing some writing. And mm. so she chose <laughs> to manage her desire for the dog. <laughs> with the empty nest. Yeah. yeah. At some point here, we'll um, offer you folks a breakout experience. Uh, just something I do on this show is um, let people talk a little because people learn by talking. And uh, maybe we'll do that in a few minutes. You're, um, I'd like to share one thing about what you just said, which is, I think my respect for how the theory describes nature is going up. And my respect for the way nature impacts these processes, such as differentiation is going up. But my skepticism about the technologies we've developed to grow differentiation is also going up. Can you say more about that, Eric? I think they're oversold. I feel like I've gotten more objective. <clears throat> I'm kind of watching more carefully to see the outcomes of these traditional methods, which I don't think we have time to describe them now, but those of you who've been involved with bone theory for a long time know what they are. Um, how you differentiate a self in the family of origin. And um, it's like, I believe it's like an amazingly accurate direction to go in mm -hmm. in terms of how to help the world get better because the family is so essential and self is the core of it. And um, 
Yeah, I think I'm really seeing how it's oversold and overpromised. I remember actually Dr. Bunting once saying that one thing she didn't like in one of Bowen's chapters was he said he was talking about miracles that can happen if you do this and that. And, you know, you're the perfect person to talk to about this, Lori, because you've innovated and been really um, <laughs> very gutsy and disciplined about your refinement of these technologies, including this self, to, um, you know, two together self out. Um, which we, we could talk more about maybe, but um, <laughs> maybe we need to do another one of these. If we're going to describe that because that takes time. But um, all that said, I, I still may still stand by what I said. My own opinion could be wrong, but. Well, I think Dr. Bowen would, would probably agree with you. At the same time, just as you're saying, Eric, these techniques, if you want to call them techniques, I know Bowen didn't, but these, you know, particular guided efforts for instance, um, you know, just to name a couple of them, to keep in contact with, with every individual in your family, uh, not to take sides. Um, you know, these are, as you said, as you said very, very accurately, they're huge for the world. <laughs> That's so true, Lori. You know, I mean, you know, it's probably I probably like am more skeptical and and also underappreciative. <laughs> I mean, you just listed two. They're so simple, but they're life changing and they're family changing and they're world changing. Yeah. And it's a very, very accurate picture of yeah. what you might want to do if you want to make the world better. And you just listed two of them. Yeah. And there's more. And, <laughs> and if parents... There's a lot more of them. If, if parents... <laughs> you know, I just think about my own parents, since I'm working on a memoir, they're mm -hmm. in it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, if they had had Bowen theory in their lives. Yeah. Even superficially even if they just you know had read a few yeah. books or anyway it could have made a big difference so that's that's yeah. where that's one area because the parents we parents unwittingly participate in these processes that come so naturally to us yeah <laughs> that for instance you know i'm when I think about how we decided to uh, remortgage our house to mm -hmm. in order to buy land for our son, I admitted to myself this was an emotional, this was an emotional decision. It was not a rational decision. <laughs> it was it was emotional, but I couldn't stop myself. Well, and I'll just say, you know, longer conversation, I'm not yet convinced that it was an example of the projection process, because that thing can show up in all kinds of sneaky ways. And sometimes the place you're looking is not where it is. <laughs> so right now, I'm going to give you guys a breakout opportunity. And I'm sharing my screen because I want to show you a few things before we do that. So I think we've given folks plenty to chew on for a time to integrate and talk together for about seven or eight minutes in small groups. But I just wanna show this is coming up doc, uh, December 16th. Dr. Noon is you know, one of the most important scholars in the Bowen Network. He's the editor of the Family Systems Journal, which is a very important position because as Lori was just saying, um, 
it's very important that clinicians who deal with families understand these ideas. And we are way behind. The way clinicians get trained is got a lot of improvement needed. And this journal is one of the most powerful vehicles to make that, to make that better. And it's also true that Dr. Noon is a very interesting person. And I think in his writing and his public teaching, it doesn't always come out, but I've gotten to know him. And I think this will be a special conversation because um, he's, he's a great conversationalist and he's just published this book. So it's a way to celebrate this work and you know hear a little bit about the book. And um, also we have this coming up. Michael Gilman is um, a longtime faculty of ours now. He's in charge of our training program and he's really good at teaching. And this is an amazing film with a lot of Bowen theory in it. It's a beautiful illustration of the projection process that we've been talking about. And you can see it's coming up in January, a three hour discussion of that movie. You'd probably wanna watch the movie first. We do have this training program. We'll start it up. We're running. It's very successful right now. We have, um, you can, uh, people can apply for this. Uh, we do it online now in the spring. And we have some scholarships available thanks to our very good friends at Pomelo Real Estate. So here's some prompts for the breakout questions. Very simple. like to recommend that you don't waste time with introductions. It's really not about making friends, just a chance to integrate what you're thinking, say what you think, somebody jump right in, say what you're thinking about, pass the baton after two minutes. All of this stuff's on YouTube. This conversation will be on YouTube. So I'm gonna use the breakout function now to set up these breakout rooms. You don't have to participate, you can jump out. You have an option on your toggles there to let yourself out of the breakout room and come back here and wait. Like I said, it'll be about uh, eight minutes and then we'll come back and give folks a chance to talk to Lori and ask Lori their own questions. I'm just talking about Ann Bunting a little bit now. Um, when Lori mentioned uh, Ann Nicholson, how you know, if if you if you say if one brother was to say something negative about the other sister to the other sister, and then the sister doesn't say anything, just is silent, mm -hmm. which Lori mentioned as a kind of more, a little bit more passive or indirect approach to detrangling versus the one that she teaches. Mm -hmm. um, Ian Bunting would be so consistently dead silent if you gossip to her about somebody else, <laughs> she'd just slam you with her silence. And uh, she had this deadpan face she'd give you mm -hmm. that taught volumes, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's, it's, it's amazing how tempting it is to join someone who's um, kibitzing with you about how frustrated they are with the other person and because emotion is so tempting to get into mm -hmm. you know and that two-on-one it's 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 like a drug you know it's like someone offering you a little chocolate and to to sit there and be so disciplined although i say disciplined Lori and ann but um it didn't seem that I think it was natural to her. It was natural. She wasn't even really trying. She, I know she did think about it, but I, I think a lot of times she didn't have to think. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know exactly why, but I, I think partly it's the family she came from. Not to say they were perfect, they weren't, but... Um, so I can't hear you right now, Lori. Can you say something? I want to see if I can hear you. Yes, I'm here. Okay, there we go. So folks, we have five more minutes. If anyone would like to um, just get in on the conversation here and share any kind of reflection from your small group or from the discussion we've had, 
Dave Galloway could start us off. Yeah, there's uh, myself and another person. We're very interested if Lori was, uh, could share anything that was an insight from some of the tapes she's been watching. Watch her talk at the Bowen Center. Get the recording. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Laurie. <laughs> I'll, I'll do that too. Send me a reference. You were there, Galloway. I saw you. Oh. Go ahead, Laurie. Uh, yes. Well, um, that was where I learned that you could put two together and self out. But the other thing I'll say about it is that Dr. Bowen did not seem overly concerned about always being polite. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And always, you know, going about things in a way so that everyone in the family would feel comfortable as we go along. So that's, that's something that I find, I, what I presented at the symposium is not something something that I'm doing all the time or a lot of. Uh, it was a pretty, you know, carefully, it was, it was something I had thought about doing for quite a long time, I would say, probably yeah, for years. In, in then, her own family, for those of you who weren't there, yeah, in her own my family. family. Yeah. And then the, the moment came where I saw an opening and I saw how I could say something that was paradoxical so people who go around saying paradoxical things you know they're not, they're not very popular and they're not considered very polite but what i realized is that i was in this position with my family almost almost at the point of saying is it okay with you if i differentiate a self <laughs> And getting their permission first, and yeah. and I, you know, I still do that, and um, so that's I, I guess that. But that was one thing that really struck me. I mean, I'm in favor of politeness. I tend to be a polite, mm -hmm. woman. but um, but that was one thing that struck me is that he was not that concerned with being polite or even being understood. It, it was might okay even be harder. If, it was okay if you didn't understand, if you didn't understand what if the family didn't understand what he was talking about. He had given, it was like a shot in the arm in the family. It was, it was a shock, mm -hmm. you know, partly because, hey, you're not being polite there. You're, you're making a comment about two other people's relationship with each other. That's not very polite. So anyway, he was a transgressor. <laughs> <laughs> or you could say in the business world, they have this really great term disruptor. Um, somebody asked, how can I learn more about two to, to the other self out? So I'll let you answer that here, Lori, as we're closing. But I want to just give the quick summary, as I would put it, is it's a technology that Dr. Lasker has refined that she learned from Bowen, and it has to do with the theory of triangles, that if you de-triangle, meaning get out of the inside position, you benefit and the family benefits both. They both benefit. And that the effort is to get into a position where instead of trying to get on the inside, you actually make moves that put the other two together and you're on the outside and you actually embrace them talking about that you're <laughs> losing your mind or that you're you're weird <laughs> and you, you know in a disciplined way you stimulate differentiation in the system by using that technology so Lori, i want to thank you because we're right at the end okay. but i think it's a good place to to for you to say one more thing which is simply how do you learn more about this two together self out maybe we should have another conference on it here we've had a number of them we've never recorded one okay. but i want to say at the just as my closing piece is to thank you for all the years of work really and also just your friendship and support Thank you. you. And a strengthener for many people, and I'm one of them. Thank so, you so much. 
What do you think, Lori? How would they learn more about it? Well, I guess the way I'd like to close is to go back to a question that Kirk Morrison asked me in our breakout. Um, well, I don't know if he actually asked me this, but it was an answer I gave, which is the value and the function of, of using paradox. Um, mm. That you're dealing with a process that's deeply unaware. And if you just bring it up and let's have a conversation, um, and I know all of us have done this with our family members to try to teach them Bowen theory. It doesn't really get at the heart of the matter. Um, you know, and there'll be explanations and there'll be uh, defensive. This, this is how, anyway, the, the value of paradox is that it goes to the heart of the emotional yeah, thank experience you. of the person. It Lori, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but I like <laughs> to let people go on time. And I just want to ask one more is what's the best written? What's the best thing to read? Have you published in the family systems journal that you think is recommended for this? Or would you say the anonymous paper, Bowen's anonymous paper on differentiation of self in his book, Mike Kerr's chapter 16? What would you say? Well, I think the anonymous paper, that's the way I got started. Good place to go. Yeah. That thing is worth rereading and rereading, just like Little Women. See you, folks. I hope you come back and listen Thank to me so talking much. to Bob Thank Noon. You. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.